Is there a word from the Lord? Yes, there is a word from the Lord. Get your Bible, your notepad, your pen, your pencil. Let's dig into the word. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to have you with us. Welcome one and all. We're so glad to have you with us. I'm Dr. Sheldon D. Newton, coming to you from Jesus Christ Center Ministries International, located right here in beautiful Nassau, Bahamas. We want to welcome Jesus Christ Center Ministries International members and all of our partners. Hey, you're helping to make it happen as we take God's word to the world. We also want to welcome all of you who are listening here in New Providence, listening in the family islands of the Bahamas, listening in the Caribbean, listening in Israel, listening in America, listening over in Australia and Europe and England uh, and in Egypt and down there in Australia, wherever you are in Mexico and Africa, we're glad to have you with us. Shall we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. We ask you in Jesus' name for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Cause our eyes to be open with, and so that we may see what we've not seen before, our ear to hear what we've not heard before, and our hearts to understand. We thank you for your word, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so glad to have you with us as we continue on our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. And we are now about to head into, if you remember, chapter 13 of this wonderful book as we have been studying the entire book uh, for some time now. And uh, we have stated very clearly that the Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul um, had established this local assembly and he was writing them because they were having some issues. He was the apostle and he was writing them um, in the light of some questions that some of the leaders of that church brought to him from that local assembly. And um, the problems and the issues that they had back then are problems and issues that churches have right now. So we, while he, by the Spirit of God, was speaking to ch the church back then and the issues they were having back then, the Spirit of God who is so wise and all-knowing actually zeroed in on problems churches have um, not regardless of what time they're living in. In other words, it was a message or messages or his word to the churches back then and it is still what he has to say to churches now. Praise the Lord. And so we have been looking at the various issues and of course this church has issues and all kind of churches has issues. When you see a church with issues, many people would run from that church and go to another church thinking that no other, no issues at the other church. You go there and you find that they have issues, then you leave there. And you know, some people are, are never really get established and rooted and grounded in a local assembly because they're trying to find the perfect church. Well, the perfect church from the standpoint of a church that doesn't have any issues may not exist for the simple reason that churches are made up of people and people have issues. And yes, being a Christian happens automatically when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, but growing in Christ takes time, all right? Growing in Christ is a process. And because of this, when people get born again, they're coming into the kingdom with their various issues. They're coming into the kingdom with their various mindsets. They're coming into the kingdom having to deal with various kinds of loss. And we have to be able to um, tolerate them, to walk in love toward them, to be long-suffering toward them, and as ministers of the gospel, we have the responsibility of teaching them the word of God, teaching them how to deal with their issues based 
on the word of God. That's our job as pastors, that's our jobs as teachers, that's our jobs as apostles and prophets and evangelists. Our job is to give people what God has to say. Glory be to God based on the written word, based on the scriptures. So the apostle Paul by the spirit of God um, deals with them um, in the first uh, five, six chapters, he deals with them concerning issues that they were having that they did not include in the letters. And, and that is just like people. They hide the real issues. They hide some things and they only tell you what they want you to know, you know. But the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit of God, he knew there was more going on. So he took the first six chapters to deal with some key issues that they were having. And after dealing with those issues in chapter 7, he said, is now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. And so in chapter 7 he deals concerning uh, um, avoiding fornication uh, and how to deal uh, um, with uh, um, whether you're going to be single, whether you're going to be married. Uh, um, and uh, he really masterfully does a great job by the Spirit of God in teaching believers how to avoid fornication simply by if you uh, have found that special someone. He said, don't fornicate, don't have sex outside of marriage. He said, go ahead and get married. Now, there are people who may have thought that Paul, because he was not married, there are people who may have thought that Paul um, had a problem with marriage. But if you read that chapter very carefully, he did not have a problem with marriage at all. As a matter of fact, it was him who the Spirit of God used to pen some of the greatest words concerning marriage in Ephesians chapter number 5, you see? So he was not against marriage, and he encouraged people. He said, listen, if you're full of lust, if, if, if y'all are in love, and, and I mean, you know, y'all are past the, the age where you, you're able now to get married, he said, go ahead and get married, because it's better to marry than to burn. Now, he was not saying, I'm just saying, Listen, find someone and hurry their marriage so you can deal with your loss. Because you don't want to rush into marriage and then it's just a lust thing with you. And once you fulfill the loss of your flesh, then you don't want nothing to do with the person that you marry. All right? So if you read it carefully, you will see where he's actually saying, um, listen, if you found that special someone and you feel like it's time, he said, then you need to go and get married. But if you're not married and if you can focus on the Lord, and commit yourself to God, do your best to walk with the Lord as a single person and stay out of fornication, stay out of sex outside of marriage. He said, and, and then when, if your time come and you want to get married, go ahead. Now, one of the things that he really was addressing was persecution was about to hit the church big time. I think it already had started through Rome, you see, and it was about to hit big time. And this is what he was talking about in chapter 7 when he talked about the impending distress that was coming and why it may have been better for people to remain single as he was, you see. Now, he was not saying that you, you better remain single. He was saying based on what's coming, it may be best for you to be single so that you can focus on your relationship with the Lord because when this persecution break out, uh, um, you don't want to have to be so concerned about family, your family, you see. But he said, now, um, listen, he said everybody has his own gift from God. In other words, he was talking about his gift of being single. He, he can handle being single without sinning, you see. Uh, and there are some people like that. And I believe, honestly, that some people who, who think, well, I don't have, you know, I'm a man and I don't have no interest in a woman. Well, I'm a woman and I don't have no interest in a man. Perhaps God has called you to just simply be celibate and celibate for the kingdom of God. Have you ever thought of that? That may be what you're called to be. Uh, and don't go the other way. Well, I, I'm a man and I don't have no interest in woman, so I must be interested in man. No, God may have called you to be an, a eunuch for the kingdom's sake. Or you may say, well, I'm a woman, but I don't have no interest in man. I, I only have interest in woman. No, 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 don't go that way. If you're born again, uh, um, God did not put that kind of spirit in you, all right? Maybe you're called to be a eunuch for the kingdom's sake. So commit yourself to the Lord and, and tell the Lord, listen, I surrender everything I am and everything I have to you, and I'll just live for you, and I won't focus on relationships at all uh, um, because I don't have no desire uh, um, for if you're a woman for a husband, and I don't have no desire if you're a man for a wife. So I'll just focus on you, Jesus, and I'll just do what you call me to do. You know, just be a eunuch for the kingdom of God's sake. 
But don't go into those abominations of homosexuality or lesbianism because they'll cause you to end up in the lake of fire in hell. And I know some people may look at them and say, oh, you're judging. I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what the Bible teaches, all right? And if I don't tell you what the Bible teaches, the Lord will hold me responsible. And I'm not going to be held responsible for anybody going to hell when I could have helped them to understand that that's not the way to go, all right? The Bible said if you see people going in the wrong path and you don't warn them about it, he said, I'll require their blood at your hand. Well, I, I, I'm not going to allow that to happen, and I, I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. Now, you may not want to hear it, but there it is, all right? So that's in chapter 7, and then in chapter 8, from chapter 8 straight into chapter 10, he deals with the issue they had in regard to idol worship. And he, try, I mean, masterfully in the anointing of God shows them that just because you could do something, that doesn't mean you should do it, all right? And that's a powerful powerful principle. Now, if you want to uh, um, know what that is and you missed those uh, um, teachings, you can find them right here on YouTube. Just go back and, and look at other teachings we've done on the book of 1 Corinthians and you will find them. Now, after that in chapter 11, uh, um, he goes into a masterful, masterful understanding of the Lord's Supper. And then into, uh, um, he's talking now heading into chapter 12 where he's dealing with the body of Christ. And he's dealing with the body of Christ in relation to gifts and callings, gifts and callings, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the manifestations of the Spirit, and the calling of the ministry. And so he uh, masterfully by the Spirit of God shows that every believer is a part of that mystical body, that supernatural body, the true church, the body of Christ. Every person who receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. That's the true church, all right? The true church is not a building. The true church is not whether you're a denomination. The true church is a born, is born again, blood-washed believers. That's the true church. They, we have been baptized by the Holy Ghost into one body, the body of Christ, all right? And so I, I'm, every part of that body has a function. Every part of that body is called to do something. And you need to ask the Lord to reveal what part of the body you are supposed to be and get busy learning and preparing and training to function in that part. Now, I said also that the training ground for ministry is the local church. That's where you're taught, that's where you're fed, and that's where you learn. And, and, you, and you give yourself to wherever you are in that local church and become grounded. Like I said, a lot of people are not grounded in the local church. They keep running from church to church trying to find a perfect one, which does not exist, all right? Because people are there and people have issues, all right? So now the Apostle Paul, um, masterfully after talking concerning manifestations of the Holy Ghost and talking concerning uh, um, the ministry gifts of Christ, the Apostle, the Prophet, the Evangelist, the Pastor, the Teacher, he is now about to get into really the, the, the uh, I would call it the, um, I would call it the, the he, he gets into the mean core of, of, of what the church is supposed to be operating in. Because all of the problems that this, this local church had could have been solved if they had learned to abide by the commandment of the law of love. Now, what is the commandment of the law of love? Jesus said it in John 13, 34, and 35. And I know that you may know it um, um, or could quote it, but I'm going to turn to it because I can quote it too. But I'm going to turn to it because I want to read it. And I want you to hear what the Master said. In John 13, verses 34 and 35, he says, A new commandment I give unto you. Well, Jesus, what's that new commandment? that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. My, my, my. Now that's a high order. <laughs> that's a high order. It will take spiritual maturity to walk in the love of God as he loved us. You see? Why? Because he loved first. He loved us first. He did not wait on us to love him. He did not wait on us to want to serve him. He loved us 
first. Hallelujah. He loved us even when we were in sin. Romans 5 and verse 8. But God proved or commended or showed his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world. I remember one time I was quoting that to a brother and he'd say, I thought it said the church. No, it doesn't. It said, for God so loved the world. This wicked, evil, um, lustful, malicious, hateful, murdering, drunken world. <laughs> and all, all of us had a part in that before we came to Christ. Amen. But he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't wait on us to come to him. He paid the price so to make the way possible for us to come to him. You see? So one of the key things we learn right from this very principle is that love loves first. Who? Who? If we're going to walk in love and love as he loved us, we're going to have to learn how to practice love and love first. In other words, we can't wait on nobody else to do it. We have to love first. You say, well, um, suppose I love and I give all my love and everything and, and they don't return the love. Well, you know how many people after God did all he did for us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how many people still are um, turning away from the love of God? Do you know how many people, regardless of what he's done for us and regardless of how much he calls and pleads for them to come to Jesus, do you know how many people literally turn away from him? Do you know how many people uh, um, um, go against God and reject God every single day in this earth and yet he, his hands are stretched out to them still and he still loves them, hallelujah, and wants them and cares for them. Hallelujah. Well, you say, well, well, I'm not God. Well, I'm glad you said that. If you're a child of God, he has put his love in your heart. The Bible says in Romans 5, 5, that he has shared abroad his love in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now, in him putting that love in there, he expects us to walk by that love. That's why Jesus could tell us, listen, I'm giving you a new commandment. <laughs> What's the new commandment? Love others as I have loved you. Care for others as I have cared for you. How did you care for us, Jesus? I didn't wait for you to show me love. I showed you my love, even though it may have meant that you turned away from me, you spit in my face, you didn't want nothing to do with me, you preferred the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life. Yet, I loved you enough to pay the price so that if you want me, I am here for you. Glory be to God. See, that's love. Now, we're not talking about love in marriage here, but this is the kind of love, according to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, that the apostle Paul said the husbands are supposed to love their wives with. Husbands are supposed to love first. Yeah. The Bible said husbands. He said, why well, submit to your husband? But then he said, husbands, love agape that's the greek word here agape your wife hallelujah what love her love her first put her first Woo! you know how many marriage problems that will solve if we put our spouses first the wife is supposed to respond in kind you know how many marriage problems will be solved if people in the marriage stop being so selfish and we learn to put each other first we learn to be considerate of one another we're so selfish and this is the reason why we have such problems in marriage now in the light of what we just looked at let's go back to corinthians and we're going here now to first corinthians chapter number 13 that's where we are all right. After Paul said all of what he had to say about manifestations of the Spirit, he now starts to get into the character necessary to handle the power of God properly. Let me say that again. After the Apostle Paul talked about the power of God, he now is about to get into the character necessary to handle the power of God properly. Now listen very carefully to me. Listen very carefully. There are many people right now who are trying to find the power of God. There are many people right now who want to operate in the gifts of the Spirit and they want to flow in the working of miracles, flow in 
um, gifts of healing flowing, the prophecy, the gift of prophecy, and give people this word and that word. But their character is blocking the Spirit of God from doing all He wants to do in and through their lives. My brothers and my sisters, we need to develop godly character. We need to become more and more like Jesus. We need to learn how to flow in true love, true care, and true compassion for people like God does in order to walk in His power and flow in the anointing of His Spirit more accurately, uh, more powerfully, uh, and have stronger anointings in our lives. I, I, I've been in ministry for now, I'm probably heading to 40 years, and I'm telling you that there are many people today uh, um, who are, are, are wanting so badly for God to use them, but their character stinks. They don't walk in love. They have not made love their aim. You see, um, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter, look in chapter 14 a minute, and we'll go back to chapter 13 here. But in chapter 14, notice verse 1. He said, Follow after charity. Now, charity is love, okay? He's talking about the love of God. Follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. I want to read that to you out of the Amplified Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Praise God. And verse 1 of the Amplified. Eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love. Make it your aim, your great quest. He said, make the love of God your aim. Make the love of God your great quest. Pursue love, you see? Follow love, go after love. Now we're going after everything else, aren't we? We're going after the power. We're going after the anointing. We're going after um, saying that, um, oh, I want to prophesy, and oh, I want to work in miracles. But he said, no, he said, pursue love. Pursue love. We'll go back there to chapter 12. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, notice the last verse. He's talking about the manifestations of the Spirit. He said, but covet or desire, that's what the word covet means, desire earnestly the best gifts. Now, you may say, well, what's the best gifts? I would say the best gifts are the gifts that you need at the moment. <laughs> All right? He said, the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. A more excellent way of what? a more excellent way to pursue the manifestations of the Spirit. In other words, my brothers and sisters, perhaps we are going after this thing wrong. We are running after the power of God instead of running after the character of God. And if we run after the power of God instead of running after the character of God, we'll never be able to fully flow in the power of God to the degree that we can because we lack the character of God which is necessary to handle the flow, the full flow of the power of God in our lives. Are you hearing me? So I, I, I'm hoping that um, by the Spirit of God you hear me because when you talk about this subject of the agape love of God and caring for others, caring for them like you would care for yourself, caring for them first regardless of how they react, regardless of how they behave, you walk in love. You refuse to get offended at them and refuse to get offended at their attitude and refuse to get offended at their behavior behavior and just show them the love of God. And, and, and if you do that, my brothers and sisters, you'll be at a place where according to this passage, Paul says you position yourself to be used greater in the manifestations of the Holy Ghost. He said, he said, listen, yes, desire them. He said, but let me show you the best way to have them. Let me show you the best way. Here's, here's some of the best way. Notice chapter 13 now. Though I speak with the tongues of men, and of angels, and have not love, charity, love, I am become as a sounding brass, a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You say, well, Bishop, what that mean? That means you could speak in tongues all day long. But if you don't treat people right, if you don't show people the love of God, if you don't show people the compassion of Jesus, he say you're like a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You see, you, 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 you don't have the character to handle the power. 
You see, you need to walk in love. Then he says, and though I have the gift of prophecy, and that's what a lot of people are running after right now, and a lot of what is happening is not the gift of prophecy. I'll tell you that right now, based on the word of God here. Because if you read 14 and verse 3, it said, He that prophesied, speaking unto men, the edification, exhortation, and comfort. And a lot of what's being given is not that. He said, and though I have um, the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, that's the word of wisdom, which deals with future events, and the word of knowledge, which deals, which deals with the past and present. You see, and have, and, and though I have all faith, gift of faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, he said, I am nothing. Wow. You can imagine being used mightily by God in these manifestations of the Spirit, and then you stand before God in the end, and God tell you, say, um, in the midst of all of what I did through you, your character was so bad that I, um, you were not walking in my character and therefore you're not getting any award for the simple reason your motives were all wrong. Oh my God. The, the words I live for, the words I long to hear, the words I, I pray God that I hear from my Lord Jesus is well done. Well done, Sheldon. Well done. Oh, that would be music to my ears. Oh, that would be heaven to me. To hear the master tell me, I'm pleased with you. Oh, my brothers and sisters, that's that's what we all should be living for. Not living for the praise and accolades of men where people run around talking, oh, you anointed, today, eh? Oh, you gifted, today, eh? Oh, you got more power than everybody else I see, eh? Oh, look at you operating in all of this, eh? Who? no, 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 no. Those kind of things will pass away. They will pass away. And listen, if you live for that, the same people who praise you and speak good to you and speak well of you and, and build you up may be the same ones who later on say crucify him. <laughs> so don't live for the praise of men. Jesus said, how is it that you live for the praise of men and seek not the honor or the praise that comes from God alone or God only? That's in um, John chapter uh, 5 verse 44. There's a praise that comes from God only. There's an honor that comes from God only. And I live for that moment. I live for that moment. Glory be to God. So he said, I can have these gifts operating. He said, but if I'm not walking in the character of God, which is love, he said, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, he said, it profits me nothing. Well, let's ask this question then. What's God's definition of true love? If God was to describe to you what real love is, what would he say? Would he say what a lot of people think? Oh, it's a feeling that you get. No, he won't. Because <laughs> love is not a feeling. Because if you ask Jesus when he was in Gethsemane, if he felt like going through it, what he had to go through for us, he would have said, no way. Because he even said, Father, if there be any other way, he said, let this cup pass from me. He did not feel like going through what he went through for us. But see, love would. And love did, you see? So love is not a feeling. I, I want you to get that worldly concept of love out of your mind. Because feelings change. God is love and God does not change. Therefore, love does not change. It does not change, all right? So he says, here's God's definition of love. Here is what he wants us to practice. And we're just going to say them out and then we're going to have to take a break and get back into this next week. Notice this. He says, love suffers long and is kind. Now, a lot of people suffer long, but they're not kind with it. He said, love suffers long and is kind. Love envy it not. Love want it not itself. Love is not puffed up. Love doesn't operate in pride, you see. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love is not rude. Love seek it not her own. Love is not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never fails. Now, as we um, come to an end, let me read that to you real quickly out of the Amplified Bible as we, so that we can be prepared for what's coming next week. Here it is. 
First Corinthians 13, beginning at verse 4. Love, this is love now. He said, what did Jesus say? My commandment to you, my new commandment, is that you love others as I have loved you. Here it is. Here's how love behaves, husbands. Here's how love behave, wi behaves, wives. Here's how love behaves, children of God. Here's how love behaves, preachers, teachers, ministers. Here's how love behaves, Christians. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious and boils over with jealousy. Love is not boastful or being glorious. Love does not display itself haughtily. Love is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. Love is not rude, unmannerly, and love does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. Great God. Love is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to suffered wrong. Love does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails, never fades out, nor be or becomes obsolete or comes to an end. As for prophecy, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, it will be fulfilled and pass away. As for tongues, the, they will be destroyed and cease. As for knowledge, it shall, will vanish away. It will pass away. It will lose its value and be superseded by truth. For our knowledge is fragmentary, incomplete, and imperfect. And our prophecy, our teaching is fragmentary and incomplete. But when the perfect, complete and perfect total is comes, the incomplete and, perf and imperfect will vanish away, become antiquated, void, and superseded. And of course, what he's saying there is that we are all growing and we don't know all there is to know and we are all learning. Our, no matter how much knowledge we think we have, no matter how deep we think we are, we still have ways to go, miles to go, ways much more to learn. And so we need to keep ourselves teachable and stop thinking like we know it all. But notice how love behaves. Notice the character of the love of God. Now, here's my um, homework assignment to you, and here's my challenge to you. Take some time this week and go back over 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 3. If you can, get yourself your Amplified Bible, and if you're online, you can get it free. Just go online and go to Gateway um, Bibles, uh, 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 or put in the Amplified Bible online, and it'll come up. And just read verses 4 through 8 uh, um, for the next several days until we meet again um, next week. And just read that every day and then begin to practice it. And I'm telling you now, you are going to get tested. Your love will be tested. Trust me with that, okay? Your love will be tested. But I'm encouraging you to practice it. To practice love. Obey the Lord Jesus. You say you love him. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Obey the Lord and practice love. Do your best to care for people like the Lord Jesus cares for us. Do your best to care for people like you care for yourself. All right? And God willing, next week, we'll go further in understanding the love of God and how to grow in our walk with Christ because that's what it's really all about. The more we choose to walk the way of love, the more we become more and more and more like Jesus. Until Till we meet together again around God's word. This is Bishop Sheldon D. Newton reminding you that God loves you and we love you and Jesus is Lord. So glad that you joined us for this time in God's word today. And we want you please to go ahead if you want to see other videos coming to you from Jesus Christ Center Ministries International. Subscribe to this particular page. Like us on Facebook at Jesus CCMI. 
And by the way, if you have prayer requests, please email us. Our email address will be on the screen in just a moment. Email us and let us know how we can pray for you. Until we meet together again around God's word, remember, Jesus Christ is Lord and divine love flows.